And so we're changing all the time. So what's happening in your life? Are you content? Are you practicing extreme calm? Are you balancing your, your life with activity and downtime? You know, what is your, what's your self-talk like? Do you believe in your excellence? Do you love yourself? Are you beating yourself up? Are you regretting decisions that you made? All of these things will affect what your optimal weight and situation is for your peak performance. Welcome back, everyone, to the YTP episode 38. I am Jess, your host, and I got the Beej with me today for our monthly show, Ask the YTs. Beej, hey. Hey. And uh, we got some good questions that we're going to dive into today about plant-based nutrition and about athleticism. And we didn't get any questions on mindfulness, but I have a feeling that that subject matter is going to seep into the answers somehow. I was saying today as we were walking this morning that everything I do and think now and the way I communicate and every way that we're going about our life and the things that we're moving into have a mindfulness aspect to it. And I think I said something to you on our walk today about like I can't escape mindfulness. Not that I want to, but I just can't escape it. It's everywhere in my life. When I wake up in the middle of the night and my mind wants to wander, I go right to a mindfulness practice and I go back to sleep. It's even in my dreams. I was telling my spiritual teacher that uh, not too long ago, that it's even in my dreams that I'm being mindful in my, I'm stopping myself in my dreams and becoming mindful. So I'm sure that mindfulness is going to come into the answers somewhere today. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm quite there yet. Or <laughs> It's okay. You're my husband and pro- <laughs> protege. My, um, what do they call it? Uh, you're like, you're an intern. <laughs> you're my intern. Anyway. So let's see. One thing I wanted to announce, address, and say is that I've been posting some food pictures lately, some recipes. Thank you so much for supporting those and giving us a like on social and all the comments about how delicious they they look. And that's because I'm doing a lot of recipe testing right now. Uh, people are asking for these recipes, but it is official that we are working on a cookbook, and I'm not going to say too much about that. I think you can probably guess that it's going to be plant-based. I think you can probably guess it's going to be geared towards athletes. But it's in, I don't want to say it's in the very beginning stages, but it's in the very beginning stages as far as, you know, we're looking for a literary agent, putting, putting together a book proposal and all of that. So I'm not going to be giving out the recipes at this point. However... If you sign up for our newsletter, you're going to get one of our recipes right away. And then we send out a weekly newsletter. That's it. And it's going to keep you up to date on the podcast. And then we we throw in a little extra in there too. So sign up for the newsletter. Go to our site, yogitriathlete.com, and get your name in there. You'll get one of our recipes right away. And it's more important than ever, you guys, to share the podcast, to share the message that we're trying to get out there about living a vibrant life, that it is within reach for everyone to have more vibrancy in their life, to have less suffering in their life, to have more health in their life, to have less illness in their life, that that it is possible. And if this podcast is speaking to you, if you're a YT athlete and our way of coaching is speaking to you, please keep helping us share and spread the message. It's more important than ever for us to be able to get this cookbook out there to secure a publisher and have this thing come to life. So we're really excited. It's not even really a decision that we made. It's a vision that came in many years ago. For the last five years, I've been collecting recipes in a notebook that I've been creating. And it became very clear towards the end of our tour that this cookbook's supposed to come to life. And so that's that's not going to be without a lot of um, work and, and will and discipline to get it done, absolutely. But I know that she is meant to be. So anything that you can do to help us spread the word, please, if, if this is speaking to you, send it to people that you feel will benefit from it. Anything else on that, Beach? I'm super fired up for it. It's everything I've been eating and taste testing and there's just it's going to be so impactful for athletes i think i think yeah absolutely give them the alternative to 
eating with the bagel in the morning. <laughs> with and it's butter. not, it's, I don't think I said this, but it's more than a cookbook. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's way more than a cookbook. It's going to be all the little details and busting the myths and answering the questions that we have found the answers to and found the solutions and found the most economical way to produce these beautiful, vibrant meals on a very small budget and using the grocery stores that are around us, that you don't or, have to go find some specialty food store to get the ingredients. Or the farmer's markets. There are a lot of, you can get the farmer's markets locally. Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's all vibrant food. Like, hi, like why are, how are we able to be so alive and vibrant in this moment? And it is directly related to what we put inside our bodies. And I think we've been saying that for years. Yeah. And we've come to this point where we just want to continue to share what's working for us and making us feel alive and vibrant and smiling every day. And I'm sure the sunshine has something to do with it here in California, but the food that you put in your, your body is the single most important thing you can do to changing your outlook. It has so much to do with your mindset, you know, what you're putting in there, the vibration of the food that's in your body You know, is it something that has grown up from Mother Earth and has bright colors to it? Or is it, you know, frankly, is it the decaying carcass of a tortured animal? I mean, that's really what it, that's really, you know, I don't want to get too PETA on everyone, but that's really what it is when we eat animals. It's the decaying carcass of a tortured animal. So anyway, if that's your vibe, that's your vibe. But you're, if, you're, if that's your vibe and you're listening to this, then just know that there's something in there that's looking for something lighter and more vibrant and more colorful. And so this cookbook is coming to life. It's literally writing itself. We're excited to say that uh, we'd love for you guys to be a part of it. So sign up for the newsletter and you'll get one of our recipes right off the bat. All right, let's dive into our questions. What do you say, Beach? Yeah, let's do this. Okay, so one of these questions actually came in last month just after we recorded our episode, and it's really cool because timing is divine, and there's a little bit of an update to this question um, that I'll be sharing as well. So, okay, here we go. This comes from Claudia, and Claudia is someone that used to come to my yoga class in Rhode Island. I miss that class so much. Hey, Jess, uh, to your recent post, Ask the YTs, please tell how you eat to sustain your lifestyle. I'm starting to add more vegan to my diet, but I don't want to lose weight, and I'm watching my sugar, a.k.a. carbs, as well. So she's eating more vegan. We love it. She doesn't want to lose weight, but she's watching her sugar. So I'm wondering if maybe there's a sugar issue. I'm assuming there's a sugar issue there, like maybe she's had her numbers done. And equating carbs with sugar, I mean, there's more to that. So if you, you could start by going back to our podcast with Dr. Neil Barnard, and he addresses this right at the very beginning of our podcast with him, where he talks about, we're talking actually about the Atkins diet right off the bat on our interview. And he's saying how, you know, it seems like it makes sense, right? Like you want to stop eating a lot of sugar and maybe more protein and, and less carbohydrates in your, in your diet. However, what they were finding from a study that they did at Yale University was that they were putting um, people through this scanner. Oh, I can't remember the name of the scanner. Anyway, you got to listen to the podcast. And what they were finding was that there was fat, animal fat, that was built up in the muscle cells. And so what was happening was the sugar that was coming into the body or the carbohydrates that was coming into the body was staying in the bloodstream right? Because it wasn't able to get into the cells because the fat was, was blocking this, the, the openness of the cells. So if you think about trying to put a key in your car door and somebody puts gum in the, in the keyhole, you're not going to be able to get that key in, right? So that's kind of the dispelling the myth of diabetes that it's about like, don't eat, you know, high sugar things. Although there's a difference between the good carbohydrates and the bad the carbohydrates. complex carbs and the simple carbs. Yeah, exactly. But it's about that there's too much sugar in the bloodstream. So when you look at, as, a, as opposed to 
treating the symptoms, you look at what the cause is. The cause is many times with diabetes, and this is why it's so heavily tied in with eating animal products, is that the fat from those animal products is clogging the cells, not allowing the sugar to get out of the bloodstream and into the cells. So it's building up in the bloodstream, and what that's resulting is is high numbers on your uh, blood, blood results that you get back. So talk about the simple carbs and the complex so, yeah, carbs. Yeah, so complex carbs are, are full. They have fiber in them. They have the sugar is slow release, whereas the, uh, and they're, they're, whole, they're whole foods. They're basically in their original form. And why is the fiber so important? Because it helps release the sugar in a slow, slow way throughout the day. Like it's not, if you just have the sugar, it's going to immediately like a, a gel. Like people who are athletes, they take the gel because they want that quick hit. When you add some substance to it, the fiber, it just slowly releases it in the body, in the bloodstream. So Mother Nature has packaged it perfect. Of course she has. Yeah, she knows what she's doing. She knows let's what she's doing. Let's let her do what she does. So those are the complex carbs. So fruits, um, sweet stra- potatoes, strawberries, sweet potatoes, apples, um, oranges, bananas. And don't fear the fruit. Don't do fear not the fruit. fear the fruit. <laughs> fruit is good for you. Yeah. You don't need to take that to an extreme, but... You know, fruit is good for you. Continue to, to continue to have it. But I also wanted to say, you know, I was looking at uh, Garth Davis had a, had, a, had a little bit to say about the people that he sees. He's he's in he does gastric bypass surgery, and what he does is he has changed himself. If you don't know who he is, he changed himself to a plant based diet a few years ago and has made some major uh, major improvements in his health, in his personal health and health. And now he recommends that for his patients. But when he looks at people who, who say they want to lose weight, he sees in their food log that a lot of these people are still having meat and dairy throughout the day. And they're, and mainly their breakfast is made of eggs and sausage and sandwiches for lunch and chips. And, you know, a lot of that is what the, what people are missing. They, they're, thinking that if they have the meat and they have the dairy, it's okay. It's just the other carbs, the fruit, the potatoes, the rice that is affecting it when in actuality it's the meat that they're putting into the body. And, and you again, were just it's, that. it's because the animal fat is clogging up the cells. And the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is that eggs and dairy and other animal products like meat and chicken and poultry – don't contain any fiber whatsoever. And the fiber is what slows down the carbohydrates effect on the blood sugar levels. Yeah. And he talked about, he talked about another study where chicken was the most correlated with weight gain. So chicken we, is so we high consider in fat. chicken as a healthy alternative, but it's not. And so to put things in perspective, uh, you know, fat is dense with calories there's nine calories per, per each gram of fat. Okay. Nine calories. 3.7 per calories gram. per gram of carbohydrate. So you can see the difference there, fat versus carbs. All right, less calories per gram of carbs. So eating the fruits, eating the vegetables, eat lots of them. And stay away from, so we've talked about the complex carbs, so let's talk about the simple carbs. So that's like the package stuff. The that's- bread. The white Pastas. white rice, you know, white rice, yeah, definitely as brown to rice brown is better. Rice, white mm-hmm. rice has been bleached and the fiber has been removed. Chips, we, you love chips and I love chips. We love chips and those are processed foods, so they're not health foods. I don't care if they're quinoa chia chips; they're not health foods. They're processed foods, so be aware of what you're putting in your body. Like I'm very aware when we put those in our body. When I house my favorite. Whole Foods, Ripple Chips, Super Salt, love them. I understand what I'm putting in my body. So it's just the, it's just the mindfulness around what we're putting in our bodies, which is fuel. And the best way to look at your food is look at your plate and say, is this as close to its natural form as possible? And if you can say yes, dive in. If it's just a pile of processed foods, look at that eat it and notice how you feel, right? And so mother nature does package her food perfectly. So if you 
are living in a climate where there are farmers markets all year round, hit those as much as you can. In the winter time, there is in states where it's still cold, there are some farmers that are doing some gardening and there are some, you know, indoor farmers markets and hydroponic greens and things like that. See if you can seek those out in your community. If not, you've got to do the best you can at the grocery store, still get your greens and in the summertime, really hit the farmer's markets hard. Yeah, you can get everything you need there. Yeah. Minus the paper towels and yeah. toilet paper. But All right. I think we hammered the, the carbs. Is there anything yeah. else you wanted to say no, about I think that's, that? I think that's good. Okay. You don't want to spend too much time on it because you can dive in and go down that hole. Yeah, I know. We got to keep moving on. We'll we gotta, add resources in the show notes. We got to be efficient for you guys. And I just want to say... That I talked to Claudia just a couple days ago via Facebook Messenger to let her know that we were going to address this question and what has happened in the last month, in the last six weeks since she submitted her question was that she's eating a vegan diet and guess what happened? (laughs) What? We're waiting. Her sugar dropped 11 points. Awesome. Yeah. Amazing. Because she's not eating the animal products anymore. So that is proof in the pudding. That is, at least it's proof in her blood work. So, all right, moving on. Next question. All right, this is from Amy. What's the best fuel post long run? And her second question is, how can you stay motivated in the winter? And this is coming from someone in New England, which we're very familiar with. So, Jess, do you want to answer? Okay. Yeah, well, do you want to, let's start with the post long run fueling. So the first thing I want to say with the post long run fueling is that we can totally give you a recipe for that as, you know, time frames and things like that. But you also want to look at what was your pre-run fueling and what was your fueling during your run? Because if you're already in a hole, then you can eat as vibrant as you want afterwards, but your body's still going to be catching up. So let's just say that you're a huge proponent, BJ, of being super hydrated before runs and then, you know, fueling during the run. If you guys want to know more about this, then ask a question for next month. But going into post-long run, run fueling, the first thing, let's go back to sign up for a newsletter because that recipe you're going to get is our one of our favorite recovery smoothies that we have as soon as we get back from our runs. And then within about an hour to an hour and a half, we have a whole foods plant-based meal. I like to incorporate dark leafy greens and beans and seeds, so hemp seeds or pumpkin seeds or chia seeds, maybe some zucchini, avocado for some good fat and oil, and then nutritional yeast, apple cider vinegar. So that's something that I would have, or rice and beans on a tortilla, awesome. And these are things, it may sound like a lot, like you just rattled off a bunch of things, but these are all things that we have in our house, and we can prep a salad with all those items in less than two or three minutes. Yeah, that's the high vibe kitchen right there. Yeah. It's just stocking your cabinet so that this stuff is available. But Be- Because the thing that, just want to interrupt, the thing that people miss is when they get back from the run, they're on to the next thing. So it makes it more important to have this prepared before you even leave for your run. At least have the basics for it so that it, you make it a priority and spend the time after your run to recover. What, right. And if we go to a destination for our long run, we'll have in the car, we'll have a jar with a scoop of our plant-based protein powder in it and water so that we're ready as soon as we're done, we get that in. And then we drive home and then we'll have a meal. So and that meal, again, is usually a dark leafy green based salad with beans and avocado and maybe a vegetable, keep it simple, or a beans and rice. Beans and rice is the best. So economical, so delicious. And you're getting, and when I say rice, I mean brown rice. Yeah, and you make big, big bowls of it and then oh you just keep God, it in the fridge. Oh my God, it's so good. And a little bit of salsa and, and you're good to go. Or but. you can do quinoa and then, yeah, have a big vat of that in your fridge. Like the other day I came home from my workout, remember, and I had quinoa and threw a scoop of protein powder in it with almond milk and cooked it on the stove and had bananas and walnuts. And it was amazing. It was this like Mondo protein bowl. (laughs) Yeah. So that's kind of the recipe there. And it's pretty standard if you looked online And, and some people say, you know, they don't eat anything after their run. And, you know, a lot of people are really starting to test their bodies and go longer with fasting and all of that. But if you're asking this question, let's just stick to the standard recipe, come home, get that 
protein shake in your bod and then about 90 minutes later eat a meal and see how you feel from doing this. And there are times too, we'll all come back from a run and my belly, a longer run and my belly's not not right. I'm not going to force food down it. Obviously it needs to settle itself. So the first thing I do is I'll drink some water, start sipping some water. Usually after 10, 15, 20 minutes, the be- belly starts to settle. It's now balanced. And then I can add some light foods to it. So again, to your point, just keep checking in with your body after the run. You don't need to hammer down a pizza <laughs> after after post-race or post-workout, like think about how you want your body to perform in the next workout. So what you do now is so critical for that. So definitely big fans of recovery. Please take that time to recover. And I love the word that she used there, which was fueling and starting to get a mindset around the fact that food is fuel and that's it. Right. It's not your best friend. It's not the thing that's going to make you feel better if you're sad or you didn't have a good workout or, you know, watching your relationship to food and realizing that everything that you're putting in your body is either poison or medicine. So it's going to be fuel either way. It's going to be fuel for illness or fuel for vitality. And that right there is where the mindfulness comes in because you pause when you go to select the food and you say, okay, I'm, I'm, this is what I normally do. I go to the cabinet when I come home and I grab a handful of something. Well, how do you stop that process? Or how, you don't have to stop the process, but how, do you, how are you conscious of that process? And that's the pause that we talk about a lot with the mindfulness. Pause and, and see what you're putting in your hand and then go ahead and put it in your mouth. At least you know and, and are aware of what this is doing to your inside, whether it's helping you recover or not helping you recover. So it's being in that moment. And that has been a huge thing. I know for me, because I'm a, I'm a grabber, like I need those almonds or something small that you can put in your hand. And, and I used to turn that into chickpeas. You know, I'd grab the chickpeas in my hand because it was easy, you know, and it sort of replaced the other, the other things that I would grab at that moment. And if the chips are here, like... Going for the, we're going for the chips. Yeah, like put it's the chips. Yeah. So much better just not to have the chips. Don't in the bring house. them in the house. Don't bring them in the house. Leave them outside. Okay, I think that's yeah, that's, that's good. good. Let's cool. move on to um, so how to stay motivated in the winter. Okay, so my first thing <laughs> with this, and this goes back to my college days, which I'm not going to reveal too much about that. That'll be in a future book. A few, a few podcasts we'll have to cover that. <laughs> I used to, to stay motivated to work out when I was in college, I would get dressed the night before for the workout class because I would go in the morning. So I would literally sleep that night in bed with, okay, so this is back in the early 90s. So I'm almost positive I had a thong leotard on with spandex shorts and possibly at that point, because I know I did own one at at one point in my life, some kind of elastic belt that I would wear as well. But I would wear that to bed and I would wake up in that outfit (laughs) and I would be, I would have, it it was for some, (laughs) for some men at that time, BJ, but I would be ready to go. Right. So I would take that excuse away. So one of the first things that I do even now is I don't get dressed the night before, nor do I wear a thong leotards anymore, much to my husband's demise. I get up in the morning and before we meditated, meditate, I did this this morning, I got up and the first thing I did was I put my running pants on, I put my sports bra on, and then I put a big cozy sweatshirt over it so I could stay warm. And so getting dressed tells me that, okay, the first thing I'm going to do this morning is get my workout done. So I think that's a big one. Uh, Mindset is everything. So I am a huge proponent of taking, even if it's one breath or five breaths or 45 minutes, adding that into your routine where you sit and you get into a still place, right? Meaning your body is still. And you decide how you're going to move into your day. So mindset is huge. Our Wednesday wisdom that we've been putting up, I've got at least a couple on meditation for triathletes and and athletes. And that's up on our YouTube channel. Another thing which is big for me, which is probably one of the reasons why we moved to Southern California besides the produce, was being warm before you even go outside. So BJ, you would always, when we were living back east, you would always make a cup of hot tea before you went out yeah, for a workout. Freezing. Because we were freezing all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Even though I was bundled up inside the house with my run gear and extra 
a tire. <laughs> I needed that tea, but I, but the tea warms you up from the inside. Adding cayenne pepper to it mm, definitely yes. warms you from the inside, and yep. it also keeps you hydrated. Yeah, so get warm before you even go outside because if you're cold before you go outside into the cold, it's just you're setting yourself up for more discomfort, right? And it's already it's already going to be cold out. You're already going to be going up against that wall. But again, go back and be disciplined with your mindset. It is so easy to be a complainer and say, oh, it's so cold. Oh, my legs are so cold. It's so easy to do that. Right, but it's it's your will and your discipline to change your mindset to a mindset that's going to be more helpful to you in the long run. This is why athletes are natural born yogis because we've got that will and that discipline. And then the last piece would be, you know, if you live in a climate that's cold outside. So if you're like in the polar vortex right now, I'm sending you a lot of love, and I'm also advising you to possibly take a vitamin D supplement. Vitamin D deficiency can lead to feelings like psychological feelings of just feeling depressed and and not very motivated. And I used to think that this whole seasonal effectiveness disorder thing was like a pile of crap. And that was back in my not so compassionate days. And then I moved back to New England from Boulder where we had over 300 sunny days a, week, a year. And I remember specifically the last couple of winters of us living there feeling that deficiency and feeling like in despair, like that I was this, had this nutrient deficiency. And so we started taking some, you know, some vitamin supplements, which, which help with that. But the fact is, if you're in an area where the sun doesn't come out that often, or when it does come out, it's still so cold to go outside that it hurts. Think about getting your body nourished from the inside through some kind of, you know, highly absorbable vitamin D supplement, high quality. You'll pay for that, but you'll get what you pay for. And, um, and that is going to help with your psychological mindset as well. Yeah. I like those. I like all those. I would Anything also, else? Yeah. I would add, you know, switch up your routine. So if you're going to be, if you're a triathlete, you know, focus on some things that are warmer, such as hot yoga, hot power yoga. I know I definitely did more yoga in the off season than I did ever. Hot yoga is the only way I was right. able to live there through like... 2013 to 2015. Do a do an indoor spin class or do, you know, studio bar a or whatever you need to do. Switch up your routine so that it keeps things interesting. Get together with friends. Start. We started a group run, which definitely got me out there uh, in the cold weather in Newport to get out first thing before yoga, and then you warmed up in the yoga studio afterwards. So, so switch up your routine a little bit. You know, your brain wants to get out of, well, your brain wants to stay in the routine because it's nice and comfortable. Break that habit. Start making some new routines, which is the creating the possibility to enjoy some other activity than the typical swim, bike, and run. The other thing is, is target some races. So I used to, there was one winter I was targeting 5Ks and 10Ks every three or four weeks just to stay, to run my way into shape, basically, and to spend the time on one small thing, even though you're training for a bigger distance race or a bigger event, focus on some small things because you're not going to have the opportunity when the summer rolls around, you're going to be in it. You know, you're going to be hitting the beach, hitting, hitting your race schedule and, and following a, a specific plan. So now's the time to get out there and enjoy yourself and find some events or races that you've always wanted to do. And it gives you that little carrot, that little something to, to strive for. And I think you, you talked about vitamin D um, deficiency. So all you back east come out here next year. Yeah, let's do a training camp. Because we're going to do a training camp. I want to get people out here. Uh, the weather out here year round is amazing. Right now, I'm swimming in an outdoor pool. We're swimming in an outdoor pool, cycling outside, running outside. So we're going to put together a camp next year here in Carlsbad or someplace in San Diego County. And Birth, birthplace of triathlon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'd be rocking. Yeah. So put that on your calendar. But also, if you can get away, like last year I ran the Austin Marathon because 
I wanted to train for something big during the winter and it was in February. So it was like, okay, if I can just get to February, I know I'm going to have warmth. And we were there for four or five days and just in the sun and soaking up the D and doing the 26.2 in the heat and shorts and a t-shirt. And that just feels so good. So if you can get away, get away. Um, If you can't get away, then get into a hot yoga class. Absolutely. And just get warm in your body. Get warm in your body. And the last piece on that is back to the mindfulness. You know, decide, sit there for a few minutes. You don't have to meditate. And think about what is the barrier to you and the winner. What is that key component that is your is blocking your enjoyment? What is it? It's usually just a belief system. Yeah. So if you say, I hate the treadmill. Well, yeah. Okay, great. You hate the treadmill. Why do you hate the treadmill? Is it the treadmill that you specifically own? Is it the treadmill workout you're supposed to be doing? Is it because you, you're listening to music or you're not listening to music? Like what, what are the factors involved? Like get to the heart of it. Just don't have that same belief. You know, I am the king of beliefs, of breaking <laughs> beliefs, you know? I wouldn't even eat vegetables growing up and now I'm like Mr. Vegetable. Man. Yeah. So yeah, I get to the root of why, why, why that wall is there blocking. I hated the treadmill until you bought one. We bought one in 2013 and it got us through the last, win- last two winters in New England. And I'll tell you, I freaking loved that treadmill. So it's just being willing to give something a try. Uh, community is huge. BJ pointed that out. Like get a friend, do it with them um, and stay motivated. And don't let each other go down that easy rabbit hole of negativity and complaint. It's, it's too easy, you guys. We live in a low vibe world and it's so easy to grasp onto that. So be the warriors that I know you are, that we know you are. You're warriors because you're even tuning in. So You know, the warrior path is called the warrior path for a reason. So mindset and busting through your conditioned belief systems that the winner is tough and all of that, that, you know, you can find contentment in all situations. And if you look at the crazy yogis in India, I mean, these guys sit outside in the Himalaya Himalayan uh, mountaintops and they're in like a cloth and they sit there and they meditate for hours a day in the freezing cold because they're practicing contentment in all circumstance. So think about that the next time you suit up with all your Lululemon layers and your under armor and all that stuff that you have. Think about those dudes out there practicing mastery. All right, next question. Next question comes from Nicolette. Hey, you guys, can you spend some time talking about optimal body composition if there is even such a thing for triathletes and runners? I read a lot of articles and hear a lot of athletes reference this idea of getting down to race weight. I guess I have three questions. What does race weight even mean? How is it determined? And how important is it in achieving success? Awesome questions great questions (laughs) they are this is the the meat of finding your optimal performance you know besides food you know you want to you want to all right so let's let's start with the basics it is a fact that being lighter will lead to better performance okay what does better performance mean to you exactly so what is better performance is it running a faster 5k? Is it being able to lift more weight? Is it being able to swim faster? What is the important thing to keep in mind is you need to find what's optimal for you because we're all unique individuals. So yes, somebody who is 250 pounds and somebody who's 150 pounds, same athletic ability, the person who's 150 pounds is probably going to run faster because he's carrying less weight. You know, that's the basics. But what I've found personally is you need to find that balance between getting too light and too heavy. And finding what's optimal for me is taking years because the way my diet has changed, the way that my performance, my goals have changed, you need to find and do testing as well. So in order to determine what your optimal body weight should be, 
you need to have some sort of gauge. So you need to do a test. So let's say I always used to think, okay, my, my ideal body weight, racing weight, I need to be in the low 140s. Okay, great. Those Ironmans that I did at around that weight, I have data for that. Then I instituted a strength training program and, and building a little more muscle and mass, and that elevated my weight higher than I ever thought it would be. And when I raced that season, the results were not that far off. But how did you feel? I felt stronger and more durable. So, so maybe overall, it took less of a toll on your body. Exactly. So always thinking about that longevity, right? Like that longevity of, okay, yeah, you can get it. You can get to the finish line at this certain weight, but you can also get to the finish line at this certain weight with maybe a couple minutes difference, not that much to even argue about, but what's going to be better for you in the long run? Like how did you recover? And, and can you do it again in the, in the near future Yeah. versus being wiped out from that first experience? So I think, I think you need to, there's not one cookie cutter approach. There's I a, don't believe there's, there's calculations that you can do. And we were playing around with some calculations the other day. And what I was finding is if I changed my answers, the calculations weren't that the, the actual body weight wasn't really changing at all. Right. And it's, and it's essentially like a couple pounds around where I am now. And so here, here's a good example too. If you're, if you're following the seven marathons and seven continents yeah. going on right now that uh, Mike Wardian is doing, but also Ryan Hall is doing it. And for those that don't remember who Ryan Hall is, he's the Olympic marathoner who was really, really good. And, and because of the training that he did and the quality of it, he had a shorter career than expected. And so what he's done, if you haven't followed him, is he's completely switched his mentality and he's gained weight and muscle. If you've seen a picture of him, he's super jacked I now. haven't seen a picture of him lately. Well, he's doing the... He was like super... Super thin. Lean. Yeah. And that's what you needed for the 212, 215 marathon or faster. But he's doing what Mike Wardian is doing, which is the seven marathons and seven continents in seven days. And he's running similar to what Mike Wardian is doing, but he's able to do it every day. And so I think you need that strength to do something of that magnitude every day. Whereas before he was running one to two, maybe marathons per year. And now he's going to do seven and seven days. So it all is based on what your goals are and your performance goals. Do you want to have a long life in the sport that you love and are passionate about? Or are you looking for that quick hit result and then not worried about the long-term results. So and I think it's a self-discovery process. But it sounds like you're also saying that race weight, ideal race weight is also going to fluctuate depending on what you're training for. So somebody who's training for, if I was saying, okay, this year I'm going 5k, man, I'm going 5k, then I could get super lean because I don't necessarily need that mass durability, right? But if I'm like, I'm this year, I'm going to do three Ironmans, then my race weight is probably going to be different. Is that yeah, you right? Pro- yeah, probably a little extra because it's the muscle that you're, that you're building and, maintain- and holding on to. And I won't be doing as much speed work. Right. So I won't be doing as much high anaerobic right. Right. working out, like caloric burn. And getting down to race weight too, I want to mention when you're working with on the bike, you're working with watts, you know, there's a direct correlation between the amount of watts you put out in your weight. It's called uh, power to weight ratio. And that's an easy way to figure out, you know, I'm going through this right now. Like I know what my weight is and I know what my power is. And I just went through a six week plan. So I'm going to weigh myself again and I'm going to do another test next week and see what has changed, whether my, because the weight is going to have a direct correlation to what power I can put out. And if you get too lean, your power is going to decrease substantially. And you obviously, you don't want that to happen. You know, a, a little decrease is okay in the grand scheme of things if you're also swimming and running because you need to balance the whole triathlete's world. But if you're talking about cycling specifically, yes, that's a great opportunity to really figure out what your ideal race weight is and, and associate that with power. And for those people who, although power is becoming much more affordable these days, but you have a great solution for people who don't want to put the power tap on and things like that. 
Yeah, so they can you know sign up with Trainer Road. Trainer Road will allow you to use your regular trainer, your stationary trainer, your cycle ops or kinetic, whatever it is, your fluid trainer. And with a few Bluetooth attachments, minimal cost, you can get virtual power. And that's how I started with power on the bike. You know, I'd been heart rate for so long and then I wanted to test it out again to figure out what power to weight ratio is. And so I was using virtual power with trainer road and it was a great opportunity. And I've since moved on because as, as you start to learn more, you progress and you want to get, you know, firmer numbers and, and, and better data. And for us, we now have a Wahoo kicker trainer, which still ties in with trainer road. And it's given us true power numbers because we do a lot of our training on the trainer. So back to the weight question, I know at X weight, I'm going to be able to produce this much power. And then next week when I test myself, I should be around the same weight and I've done a six week training plan. So I'm going to figure out, okay, at this weight, this is the power I can sustain. If I drop one or two pounds, my power to weight ratio will go up, but am I able to hold those same Watts? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So when she asked, what does weight race even mean? Race weight. Race weight even mean, I would say it's the, the optimal body balance between power and the number on the scale to equal your highest performance for that particular for that event, particular whatever event. that looks like so it's not like i'm saying okay 113 is my race weight for iron man 5k 10k half marathon absolutely not and for this hilly marathon for this flat marathon for this straight 5k so what you're saying which is not music to a lot of people's ears is it's not a black and white thing right right, right. it goes it goes back to the mindfulness, and, and I, I want to get into that a little bit, but let's get to the answers of these. So race weight is basically that optimal body balance for the particular distance that you're going to be racing that will e- equal your best performance. Exactly. That's essentially what it means. And it's determined, and there's a lot of different calculations that you can use online, little calculators that you can use online to determine it. But just let that be kind of a number that floats out there because nothing is going to tell you what is better than the way that you feel and testing it through either mock races, like going out. How many times have I done like mock 5Ks by myself and five mile races by myself to do tests? And the determination, the calculations out there are going to be like your age, your gender, Um, Your diet, uh, do you have room for improvement in your diet or is it pretty dialed in? Your activity level. Yeah, your activity level. So all of these things are so vague, like none of this is objective. It's just like what you feel like, oh, I've got my diet is awesome as you're like mowing down string cheese and bologna. You know, you might think that that's an optimal diet. So it's, you can use these calculations, but again, just let that number kind of float out there as like "Mm, maybe a range, but Testing it, putting those numbers to work, seeing how you feel, seeing how quickly you bounce, that's what's going to be, I think, your your true determinant. It's going to be a number of things that's going to come to what that ideal race weight is for that day because there's so much more that goes into it. Yeah. Right? And think about this. We didn't even talk about the stress. The stress yeah. that's involved in I need to lose five pounds. What, what the stress that, that must create in the body yeah. will definitely affect your performance. Yeah. So, okay. So we'll just dive into the so, mindfulness yeah, piece. You know, um, I can pretty much at any given time tell you how much I weigh, uh, what my heart rate is, how fast I'm running. And that's just come from years and years of letting go of the data letting go of finding out what those numbers are by looking at a watch or looking at a scale, but maybe having that watch in my back pocket, not looking at it so that I can say afterwards, like, okay, my average heart rate was this, I was running about this, and then I can look at the watch and say, oh, I was right on. So this is a really great way to, to start to dive into your body awareness and body awareness, increased body awareness is only going to help with understanding what that optimal weight is for you. So again, you can do a calculation and maybe your intellect is going to say, okay, now I've got that number and I'm going to go use that number. 
But the intellect is not, it's not intelligence. Intelligence is what you're going to find from body awareness. And understanding that every single day you are different. Every single moment you are different. Right now, as I'm speaking, there are cells that are dying in my body. There are cells that are birthing in my body. There are, you know, free radicals probably in there from maybe something I ate or a hard workout that I did that there's another cell in there eating it up, you know? And so we're changing all the time. So what's happening in your life? Are you content? Are you practicing extreme calm? Are you balancing your, your life with activity and downtime? You know, what is your, what's your self-talk like? Do you believe in your excellence? Do you love yourself? Are you beating yourself up? Are you regretting decisions that you made? All of these things will affect what your optimal weight and situation is for your peak performance. So it's like, you gotta, you gotta clean the whole house, right? You can't just like shove everything in a closet and hope nobody opens that door. You gotta clean the whole house. And, and body awareness is a big one. Body awareness is also mind awareness, understanding what's going on in your head and how that can be affecting your body. So mindfulness is a big thing and mindfulness doesn't have to be, you know, on the Himalayan mountaintop in a cloth in snow. That's, that's a form of mindfulness, but it could also be really noticing how you're feeling during that workout because you decided, okay, I'm going to do a fasted workout today. And how does that feel? Do you feel as strong? Do you feel weak? How do you feel afterwards? Did, were you toast for the rest of the day? Were you energetic for the rest of the day? So creating, cultivating the body awareness and the mind awareness of how you are treating yourself internally, because all of those things will affect your performance in sport, in life, you know, as you, as you walk through this world. So Mindfulness is big. Um, I think we answered what it means. How is it determined? So again, you can go and you can do all these calculations, but I say it's determined through the discipline of testing things out, the willingness of testing things out, finding, um, you know, that what you feel good at for a, a weight and seeing how that translates to a time. Yeah. And then um, how important is this in achieving success is the last question. Wow. How important. <laughs> Again, looking for the black and white, which yeah, if you it, go through life looking for the black and white, you're just always going to be looking, understanding that there is no yes or no for everyone that's going to be across the board the right thing. It's finding out what works for you. But And what is your definition of success. Yeah, what's I your think definition that's an important of success? One. Is it finishing the race? Is it like if you don't make that time you want to make, is that not a successful race now because you spent the last couple of months like really going for it and putting yourself all out there and being courageous and brave and amazing and then all of a sudden you don't get the time and it's not a success? And that's where we we speak to it's it's great to get that time like get that goal. We all need to have goals. Get that goal. This is the time I want. I want to run a three fifteen marathon. Yeah, see awesome. That, see, see that, that goal, number, and then let it go. Yeah, see and yourself detach from doing it. it. See yourself training. See yourself in the outfit you want to wear on race day. See yourself starting the race, during the race, finishing right. the race song. See the number on the time clock, and let it go. Right. And then get, <laughs> let it go. And then get let into the day to day work. Work every day towards that goal. So then the present moment becomes the most critical piece of your training. The present moment awareness, the present moment uh, hill repeat you're doing, the present moment foot strike, being into every single present moment that you can and detaching from that end goal. It's great to have that end goal. I have goals, you have goals, but we detach from them and we do the work now to help move us towards achieving that goal, but be detaching from it because tying to that number puts us into a state of materialism where we're 
so tune into that number and we forget about other things when the whole point of this is that journey and enjoying that journey and just of self-discovery and back to her point of how do I know um, is this important for achieving success? Yeah, it's, you know, having it's optimal race weight. Sure, it's definitely important for achieving success, but there are many other factors that should be included in that as well. And also looking at, you know, journaling is a great thing, like journaling. What is your idea of success? And then looking, looking at those answers and seeing if those answers truly bring you joy. Not I bet you, you. I bet you. One of those things is not going to be. I want to be at my ideal race race weight. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I don't know. You, you well, know, maybe it, maybe it will be. Yeah, it's different. It's different for everyone. I mean, and as a woman, so she's a woman, and I'm not going to assume that I'm going to speak for her. But as a woman, you know, oh, man, have I been through the gauntlet with weight? And I've always been. If somebody would look at me from the outside and say, "Oh, she's a small little petite girl," this small little petite girl has been through hell and back with, you know, body issues and we'll just leave it at that really nasty stuff. But, and so now I just know that if I sit every day in my meditation and I get calm and I get into my parasympathetic healing nervous system, that my body will heal. I know that I've got control, um, over every single bite of food that I put into my mouth. So to fuel my body and to do the work, to do the workouts and fuel during the workouts and recover after the workouts. And for me, all of those things determine what my race weight is. So race day shows up and I'm at this weight, which is really sustained at this point because of the way that I live and eat and I'm not stressed. And then I go out and I race and I see what that time is. And I am mindful in every moment that I can be that I see that not only is there always success on race day, but there's been a win and a finish line and great massive success in every moment leading up to it. And I could not be more proud of the way that I move through this world at this point in my life. Yeah, you have, you have perspective. You have perspective. And that's yeah. so important. I yeah. think on that point too... Journal, journaling is so, it just really is a way to capture your thoughts in the moment and to review where you were because we think so many times, oh, I did think that or I did do that. But when we actually see it written on paper and it's quite the opposite, then, you know, that may be one of those moments where you, it's like a wow moment. Yeah. Don't necessarily trust your memory. Yeah. It's, you it's need always to write it down. jaded by where you are right now. So writing it down will really capture it. And that goes back to Amy's question too, staying motivated in the winter. Like write down those moments where you're just like, you came back and you were like, it was negative five and I just killed that workout and I'm so fired up. Like write those down and go back and revisit those because you can serve as your own inspiration. Right. And then going back to Claudia's question about how she doesn't want to lose weight, I don't think we really addressed this. I just want to say that when you eat a whole foods plant-based diet, your, your body really falls into what it needs. When you're eating vibrancy, you're going to walk through the world in a vibrant body and that your vehicle, trust in the wisdom of the body, that your vehicle will find its optimal balance. Completely agree. Yeah. There's no better way than... Uh, Whole foods, plant-based diet. Eat fruits, legumes, vegetables, whole grains. Nuts. Avoid meat and dairy. Please. And eat whole, unprocessed foods. Yeah. Beautiful. Vibrant. All right, dude. Yeah, that was I rocking. I think we did it. We got to kick it, man. We got a meeting over at Lululemon. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And please, please, please share the podcast, you guys. We... We're just coming to you with open hearts. We're out here being vulnerable and sharing what we know um, based on a recipe that we've put into action that allows us to live a loving and mindful and vibrant life and relationship as husband and wife and competitors and people moving through the world. And parents, of course. I know a lot of people... Yes. concerned about Clark. Clark is doing really Clark's well. Clark's doing great. He's adjusting great to this sunshiny beach life. So he is great, everyone. Please keep liking his photos on social media. It I know. helps. He he's likes it. He's killing it. Yeah. He's killing it. 
All right, you guys, um, go to the website, sign up for our newsletter. And if you're already on our newsletter list and you didn't get the recipe that all the other people are going to get, shoot us an email. We're going to send you that recipe. So let's make sure everybody gets a little glimpse into what is coming and hold that in your hearts, you guys, because we together are going to change the face of athleticism with plant-based whole foods, eating and mindfulness for optimal peak performance in sport and life. Namaste, competitors. Namaste.